Okay, we're still in the preparing for war role play mode. I'm trying to go through different categories of role playing. We just finished with um, seeing through God's eyes, and after that, in the very last increment, it was about role playing your dream come true and your worst nightmare because that's God's plan for your life. And this, this is, you know, all generic. The specifics are going to vary by individual as to what those things are, but I'm trying to show the, like, pattern. Um, you want to do that because if it's God's plan for your life, then the role-playing and the training and the thought pattern, it's just like practicing golf or piano or anything else. You need to visualize the course. You know, in piano, you have to visualize the piece in your head. In golf, you have to visualize the course in your head. If you're playing poker, you have to visualize the layout of the cards. You know, because there are certain statistical occurrences that happen with cards so that when you're playing with enough other people, you can sort of predict who's going to have what as a hand. You can get just as scientific about poker as you can about ballet or science. You know, you, you could, anything can be a profession. All right. So role-playing is what the Christian needs to do. Role-playing means you're putting the doctrine in your head to use. In your head. You're thinking it out. You're visualizing the course. A, a soldier has to do the same thing. You have to do the same thing as an executive. Heck, you have to do the same thing if you're going on a, if you're going from, say, uh, I don't know, Houston to Dallas. You have to look at a map. It's that, it's that kind of thing. That's what role playing is. And of course, every actor understands this. Now, here we're going to talk about a role playing that we're all more familiar with and yet not at all. Role playing what it's like to be another person. I can't speak for you because some people are real good at that and others are not I'm not I have a real hard time putting myself in somebody else's head I understand God real well I understand God better than I do myself but to put myself in somebody else's head when I don't know who that person is to role play out different kinds of people and how they think I'm not good at that I watch movies after movie after movie after movie, and when I he see people talk or hear them talk, I, you know, I, I try to get inside their own thinking so that I can, it, it's a form of empathy, but it's more just to see through the other person's eyes. It doesn't matter if I like them or I dislike them. I need to see through their eyes. you got to see through God's eyes. you got to learn how to see through your own eyes. Because, you know, the person we least know is ourselves. And you also got to see through somebody else's eyes. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree. It doesn't matter if they're right or they're wrong. What does the world look like to the person? You're going to need that for a variety of reasons, chief among which is so that you know how to understand the big picture. Now, again, I don't know what your difficulties in doing that are. In my case, I have trouble grasping how people can go from point A to point B to point D the point Z in their thought pattern. Especially when mine doesn't go that way. I just don't get it how they can draw the conclusions they draw. I will never in my lifetime understand why a Muslim thinks it's totally holy to stick his butt up in the air five times a day. That's an insult to God. What does God need with you doing sticking your butt up in the air? And you know what? If you did that to another human being, that would be an insult. You can't face the person. You have to stick your butt up in the air to that person. It's dumb. 
you and I would not interact with each other laying on some rug and sticking our butts up in the air five times a day to have a relationship with each other. So why is it suddenly okay or even holy to have it that way with God? I cannot for the life of me understand how anybody can conclude that that's, that that's a, a way to have a holy relationship with God. I, the, what's the thought pattern? That goes into it. Which leads to what the thought pattern actually is. None. There's so many things in life we accept as good or right or or spiritual. That we don't even evaluate for sense. That's one of them. If you were raised Muslim, you would have heard it so many times and have had to do it so many times by the time you were five years old that you wouldn't even think twice about it being right and holy. Because when you're five years old, you have no discerning skills. All you can do is parrot and copy. So by the time you're six, seven, eight, ten, well, it's just natural to you. So you don't even think about whether it makes sense. Not until you're 20 or 25 when most of us go through our spiritual crises. That's usually the age when, you know, the whole God question ends up becoming a debatable thing in our minds because that's when we're first really able to start doing some critical thinking. Sometimes it happens earlier in life, but for the most part, most of us, when we start hitting our 18, 19, 20-year-old stage until about 25, we start to get kind of, um, what do you want to call it? We start to question everything for sense. And we usually are trying to rebel against you know, what we grew up with because it's that's the kind of age that it is. And it's right that it be like that. You know, we get a little hostile and, you know, we're full of, you know, spit and vinegar. <laughs> and that was always true with teenagers, okay? So we go through that critical phase and then we go we fall back into a non-questioning phase again. What I'm trying to say is that most people, the reason why so many silly ideas, you know, um, have so much popularity generation after generation is people don't think about them. It's accepted, it's mass, they've been doing it since they were kids or it's been around them since they were kids so it seems natural and they just don't question. I don't understand that thought pattern. And yet I too exhibit it. The non-questioning thought pattern. The idea that, oh, if you question this, something's wrong with you. Okay? There are people who are more like that than me. And they're like that about everything. And in fact, they really just don't have any curiosity. Everything to them is the moment. You know, I mean, if you were in America in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all that mattered in in school was that you were with the in crowd. And if you weren't in the in crowd, you were no good. didn't matter that the in crowd was incredibly shallow. I only cared about their hair and their gossip and their boyfriends. And they didn't care about school. It was not hip to get good grades. If you got a C, that was that meant you were, you were a good person. And if you got better than than C or B most of the time, then that meant you were a nerd and you were not you were not popular. And uh, you know that's happened to me when I was in high school and junior high, and I'm sure most of us in America, and probably overseas as well, had the same experience. Although the overseas schools valued education more than we did in America. I don't understand that thought pattern either. Why is it important to be a member of a group? What what value is that? And yet, if you were to say, well, who are you? 
I would start, like every other dumb bunny human being, I'd start identifying myself by things that really don't have anything to do with my character. I'm an American. I'm female. You know, most people say, well, I was born in blah blah I have a brother and a sister. I have a wife. I have two children. That doesn't have anything to do with who you are. And, of course, a lot of people go further and say, I'm Jewish. I'm Catholic. I'm Irish. I'm you know, Native American, as if that meant anything. It doesn't mean anything about who you are. That's just your skin. That's just your location. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Your identity is not the skin color or your religion or anything else about you, your gender. The real you is your soul, not anything else. But we don't define ourselves that way. Why? Why do we define ourselves by shallows that really don't have anything to do with our character. There is nothing, how do you want to put it? I'm an American, so what? That doesn't distinguish me as a person. That might distinguish where my loyalties are, because you should be loyal to the nation in which you live and the nation from which you came, you know, if you're an expatriate or something. But that doesn't say anything about your own character and who you are. So why do people define themselves by irrelevant facts? Okay? I don't get that either. Now, I've given some specifics here to give you an idea of where you can role play. In my case, obviously, I would have to role play all those things which I just said I don't understand. How do I relate to, or how can I get inside the head of somebody who does define himself shallowly? Or somebody who thinks it's important to go along with the crowd? Somebody who thinks it's important to, you know, only get C grades? Because, oh, too much learning, then then something's wrong with you. Someone who thinks it's important to define himself in terms of his, his um, ethnicity or um, his religion. What kind of mindset is that? Now, where I'm heading with this is, if you can get inside the head of somebody else and see through their eyes... That gives you a larger sense of the depth and the dimensions of what God is going through to orchestrate the whole world together for the grand plan that he has for all of us. And that helps us understand why things that we expect to happen tomorrow don't happen until a thousand years later. Or happen in five minutes instead. You know, a lot of people say, well, why, you know, why did God let, and I was one of them, you know, why did God let the Holocaust happen? That was a big ticket item for me when I was 12. That was when I first, I think, when I first found out about Hitler and the Jews. And it just devastated me. You know, how could God let this happen? You know, Jesus, this is how stupid I was in those days. Jesus Christ is Jewish, therefore the Jews are the favored people, therefore all Jews should be blessed. And that's not too far off the mark. It's simplistic, of course. And it's not quite what the Bible says. And I just couldn't, I couldn't, it's like, well, how could a Hitler happen? It really, it really did me in for a while. Okay? Now, there are people who have problems like I had when I was 12 about that. They get hung up. Okay? What's the mindset of a people who would produce a Germany like that? And why did God let it happen? See, I'm not the only person in the world, neither are you. We're all of us at different stages of the God question to start with. We all have different ways of analyzing things. We all have different interests. And the, the thing that really gets to me the most about this whole story is especially with regard to the spiritual life, but it's also true in every other way. Every single idea is built one letter at 
a time. One letter at a time. The guy who's, uh, you know, what do you want to call it? Your typical garden variety internist. He has all kinds of medical knowledge at his command and it's fluent and bam, 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 bam. bam. He can reel off the vocabulary. He understands that a surgeon can go waltzing in to any, you know, operating room and he doesn't have to know anybody in there. Takes five second look at the x-ray, knows exactly what's wrong and can operate on somebody he's never met. And he's in and out in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, if it's complicated surgery, an hour. And, you know, and he gets paid something like $100,000 for that time, and should be. But he can do it in, in, you know, quick. And he knows, you know, there can be a thousand things that go wrong in an operating room, and he, he'd know exactly what to do. Same thing with a soldier in the field. And to somebody who's not trained in those scenarios, it's like a miracle. And we wouldn't know what to do with it. But it's the same thing with thought itself. An opinion itself is based on so many other factors about what you learned in your life, what you're interested in, what information you've been exposed to, how accurate it is, how much you listen to it, and how much you thought about it so that you processed it and built up a kind of knowledge base in your own head. Okay, well, the knowledge base in my head and the knowledge base in your head are two different bases. So no wonder we had trouble talking to each other. No wonder it's so hard for person A, who's expressing ideas using his own knowledge base, to be intelligible to person B who doesn't have that knowledge base. That's where I have my biggest problem. I mean, I don't know about you, but this is a fundamental reason why it happens. You know, somebody comes in, he writes a comment, he can barely spell obviously doesn't care about getting the spelling right, cannot articulate a sentence. Okay, well, is that because he's lazy, or is that because it's English isn't his native language, or is that because he's just, that's just not one of his skills, because he hasn't practiced it enough. Maybe he's good at fixing cars, but when it comes to putting together a sentence, he either can't, or he's good at putting together a sentence, but he's shy. See how many variables there are? So role-playing a person helps you see through the person's eyes, has a detoxifying effect if you apply it first to the persons that bother you the most. You know, the persons or personality types. And it helps you get a better sense for God's overall timing. You know, why the Holocaust? Why did that all come together then? What were the mindsets of people all around the world that could result? And it was all around the world. People who blame Germany alone don't know the story. There would have never been a Germany if the rest of the world wasn't colluding in it. Okay. So how did the rest of the world develop such that that thing could happen? And once you understand that, even though it's horrific, you can begin to understand why God let it go on. It's really hard pill to swallow, boy. To this day, you know, I'm almost 60 now. I have, I have trouble with that the answers to that question. I've done a lot of historical study. I've read all of Hitler's stuff. I read, you know, uh, Shirer and, you know, the other guys. I read whatchamacallit, um, who was the sidekick of Hitler? The architect guy, Speer. And I read a lot of material to try to get my head into their heads to see how could anybody think like that? Only to find that once I understood their thinking, oh, by the way, the same thinking was going on in Italy, in Europe, in America, in Japan, in Africa. Well, no wonder, you know, Germany wasn't in isolation. But see, this is the point I'm trying to get at. You have to get inside the heads of the people, especially those that bug you, the time period that bugs you, or the people that bug you, or the people types that bug you, 
so that you can see the big picture. And what that also does is it detoxifies your own reaction to those people. It helps you better understand, and that will have an effect on how you use Bible in your own life. It'll also have a huge effect, at least it is on me, it'll have a huge effect on how you look at yourself. I mean, because you want to try to apply the same stuff to yourself. Role play against yourself. You know, what's inside your head? Why do you think the way you do? Not so much to be critical, but just to know yourself. As if you're just another person out on the street. Because once you can start doing that, what this does is it elevates... You know, because like I said, we're all preparing for war here. It's a head game. The more we fight and prepare inside our heads, and I'm calling it a fight because it really is a struggle to go through all these role-playing things. If we're doing that in our heads, that will make life better for the world. That will stave off or reduce whatever this upcoming war is going to be. And we're the guys on the front line, all Christians. And the ones who are the most mature are the most far advanced on the front line, the point. This is how you fight. This is what Ephesians 6 is talking about. And I'm trying to sort of flesh it out by giving some kind of practical things that you can do with the Bible that you know. Kind of just like if you were a soldier, because what are we all really? We're thinking before God. He's reading every thought we think. We need to be thought soldiers. So what does a soldier do? He role plays. And one of the role playing you got to do, and that you learn this in West Point, you know, CIA also, get inside the other guy's head. What's really going on that leads to the kinds of thought patterns and behaviors in the other person? Doesn't matter if it's ugly, doesn't matter if it's right, doesn't matter if it's wrong, doesn't matter if it's stupid. What is the thought pattern? And of course, that's the primordial thing you have to do with scripture. What is the thought pattern of the guy who's writing the Bible? We look at it and we get our own ideas out of it. And it's, you know, oftentimes we get some of that, those ideas right. But what was the author who was writing the book thinking when he wrote what he wrote? Because until you can trace the author's own thought pattern and trace his own line of thought from the first part of the book to the end of the book, you really don't know what that book says. And that's the same thing with people. So I hope that gave you some food for thought. I'm going to cut it short here. I think I've covered the examples enough. If I haven't, yell at me and I'll try to do it again.